on today's show, part one of a two-part series with Dave Hardesty, Clutch Fans himself, as we take a look at some of the names that should be on the Houston Rockets big board spots, six through 10. We have an understanding of who the top five prospects are in this year's NBA draft. So we're going to take a look at some of the really interesting names for the Rockets at spots six through 10 that they might trade down for or trade up for in this year's NBA draft. So coming up, all of that and more right here at Locked on Rock. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. With the second pick in the 2021 NBA Draft, the Houston Rockets select Jalen Green. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep getting better every day. I'm going to keep perfecting my craft. And every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian, also host of Locked on NBA Mondays, host of the State of the Rockets podcast, as well as the founder of ClutchCityControlRoom.com. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. As always, appreciate you for making Locked on Rockets your first listen each and every day. Joining us now is none other than Dave Hardesty himself, Clutch fans, the OG of all Rockets fandom everything. I'm going to give you the, the biggest title I can, Dave. You can follow him on Twitter, at Clutch fans, of course. If you're not following him on Twitter, if you're on Twitter and not following Dave, then you might be living under a rock, possibly. But, Dave, it's, it's this beautiful time of year where the Rockets are... You know, looking at this draft, we're, we're all eyes forward towards the NBA draft. And we've spent a lot of time kind of focusing on a lot of the top prospects in the draft. But there are so many, you know, even though this year is widely regarded as not necessarily uh, as deep of a draft as last year's draft was, there's still so many interesting prospects, especially, you know, spread across the rest of the lottery and even potentially further, you know, into the into the latter part of the first round where the Rockets do find themselves with that 17th overall pick. But there's a lot of flexibility there. Maybe the Rockets do something like they try to trade up in the draft. Uh, you know, they could potentially, you know, if they do fall to pick number five and they're not super excited about whoever's there on the board at pick number five, maybe they trade back down into the draft. There's a lot of flexibility that they have this time around. And so first things first is I'd like to clear up because I think I'm pretty sure you and I probably have the same top five on our big board before we get into what is going to be our, our kind of six through 10 spots on our respective Rockets big boards. But just, and it doesn't have to be in order here because I think that the, you know, distinction of who goes where in the, in certain people's top fives may be different, but I think we can safely say it's, you know, some combination of Jabari Smith, Chet Holmgren, Paolo Bancaro, Jaden Ivey, and Shaden Sharp. Do you agree with me on that front? Yeah, I think um, Shaden Sharp is debatable, but I that's the the whole uh, five that I have, and I think what I what I think will be the five when we get to the draft. Okay, yeah, and, and, and you're you're absolutely right. I think the Shaden Sharp is the one where there's a little bit of you know curiosity there. Maybe somebody has the opportunity to to jump over him, or maybe even Shaden Sharp has the opportunity to jump over one of those other guys, depending yes. on how how high a team is on him, how his workouts go, all of that. But where our focus is going to lie today is spots six through 10 on our respective Rockets big boards. Because even though the Rockets don't necessarily have a pick, you know, that that may fall in the six through 10 range, they could very easily move up into that range. Maybe one of those prospects falls a little bit lower in the draft if their stock plummets a little bit. Again, trading down, trading up, a lot of different uh, machination, mach machinations. That's the word, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Is it a CH sound? I don't, it's whatever. It's a good thing I don't talk for a living. Um, anyways, I'm going to go with permutations because I actually know how to say that word. Sure. There's a lot of permutations <laughs> for how the Rockets could find themselves in the six through 10 range. So Dave, go ahead and lead us off here. Give me your picks six through 10 on your big board and then I'll do mine. And then we're going to kind of, you know, just go over this overview of them and then we'll get into the specifics on the guys that we both list off. Sure. Well, I, and I got to tell you, this is really close. Six, well, I have six through nine. I, I'll, I'll, I'll throw 10 in there as well, but I feel like the six through nine tier is uh, pretty close. And it, and it's um, as you mentioned, really something that, you know, rocket fans have kind of been ignoring because I don't say ignoring, that's not true. Uh, just maybe, not as focused on because we know the Rockets are going to have a top five pick, but as you uh, perfectly highlighted, you know, the Rockets, if they're at four or five and those top three bigs go, I would not be surprised at all. If they, if they can't move up, if they consider moving back, because um, you know, even though I love Ivy and, and sharp as well, the, the, the potential there is really high, you know, falling back into that range and getting an additional asset could be what, what they look to do. So my order um, is currently, 
uh, AJ Griffin at six, um, Keegan Murray, seven, Jalen Duran at eight, uh, Benedict Matherin at nine, and then Dyson Daniels at 10. But I will say that, um, that six through nine range I've been, I've been tinkering with, and I'm really high on Dyson Daniels as well, even though I've kept him in the next tier at the top of it at 10, but, um, those six, that six through nine range, it's kind of a beauty. If, if you're at six or if you're at nine, you're going to get one of those guys. And that's not even to say if Johnny Davis could, could jump up there, you know, so you, you're almost just as good being at eight or nine as you are at six. And I think that's what the Rockets may look at if they end up with uh, pick number five, which is 48% of the, the possibilities. Well, hey, 48% of the possibilities did not pan out last season. And so hopefully that's the exact same case uh, this time around for, for, for the Houston Rockets because getting securing a, a top four pick would be incredible given, given all the talent at, you know, at the top end of this draft. But as you were listing off your six through 10 spots there, I was worried we we're going to run into the same predicament the last time we did when you were on this show where I, I asked you to list off your top four big board and you, you led off by saying this might be a bit of an unconventional order, but, and then you listed <laughs> off my exact top four big board. So we were in the you know same line of thinking, uh, great minds think alike, but fools hardly differ or rarely differ. So, you know, maybe that's not a great thing. Um, <laughs> the, the, the latter half of that, uh, of that saying that people tend to tend to leave off, unfortunately, but as for, for me on my, on my side of things, looking at the six through 10, I actually have the, the same first two names on that list. Uh, I've got AJ Griffin and then Keegan Murray. And AJ Griffin is probably the one where I don't I have I've, I've started vacillating less on him right I, I used to be between AJ Griffin and actually Benedict Matherin quite a bit kind of at that five six spot now with the announcement of Shaden Sharp you know I think I'm I'm firmly putting him in that top five bracket and kind of that's where that's the first like separation in the tiers for me now so AJ Griffin kind of firmly planted at that number six spot Keegan Murray after him got Benedict Matherin at number eight. I've got Tari Eason at number mm. nine, and then I'm going to have Jalen Duran down there at number 10. So uh, for you, it seems like the, the difference here, we've got, I've got Tari Eason, you've got Dyson Daniels. So that's the one difference in our lists uh, as far as just where those guys kind of line up on our respective big boards. I love the Dyson Daniels pick though. And this is where uh, last thing here in, in our first segment, before we dive into the specifics on some of these guys coming up here in just a moment, but Dave, how much do you kind of, I think at the top of the draft, right, when we're looking at the the talented individuals that could be available, the prospects near, closer to the top, I think it's so much about like focusing on the best talent you can get, right? The most talented prospect. As you go further down and deeper into the draft, do you start paying more attention to fit on some of these prospects as you're getting deeper and deeper into the draft? Yes, definitely. Um, and it's funny you mention that because I think, you know, we don't know the draft order. That'll be May 17th or 18th, the, the day of the, the draft lottery. But if it, you know, is more or less to chalk or, or as expected, you know, I start looking around eight. Um, if the Pelicans at that Lakers pick, I'm like, man, who would really fit that team? And I do look at a guy like Daniels. It may be a little early. They could go in a variety of directions. Um, but, you know, the, the Knicks, people consistently mock Ty Ty Washington there because they've been in need of a point guard, whether that's accurate or not. Um, OKC, people, you know, don't look at any kind of fit there. So they just look at, um, you know, the, the best available. So like the best prospect of upside. So that's, you know, kind of like what the Rockets are competing with. And then you start getting into 13, 14, 15. Those are all fit. I mean, that's the Hornets. You're looking at the Cavs. If, they, if these guys don't trade these picks. That's why you see, <clears throat> excuse me, that's why you see Mark Williams consistently mocked uh, to the Hornets because it's one of their biggest needs. So I think you put it, put it well as you start to go down. Yeah, because at the very top of the draft, um, you don't, you can't pass on just enormous upside. And that's why people um, without really any evidence about Shaden Sharp just yet are, are mocking him quite high because the upside is so high. Coming up, we're going to get into the first guy on our rocket specific big board spots, six through 10, and that is going to be AJ Griffin out of Duke. But first, a quick message from our friends over at Bet Online because betonline.net is your number one source for all of your sports betting stats and info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of Major League Baseball season. Bet Online is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information from live betting, playoffs, esports, and more. And speaking of and more, and you've got the NBA draft odds over there right now. You can check out who is the fan or who's the favorite, I should say, to go number one overall in this year's 
NBA draft. You got Jabari Smith Jr. at plus 100 to be the number one overall pick. Chet Holmgren, not far behind him at plus 175. And then Paolo Bencaro, a distant third at plus 325. So remember to check out Bet Online. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action available to you. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, appreciate you for making Locked on Rockets your first listen each and every day. For your next listen, be sure to check out the Locked on Now podcast, nightly recaps of every single NBA game with analysis from our local experts, free and available wherever you get your podcast, wherever you listen to this podcast. Now, Dave, let's start with number six on our respective big boards, since you and I have, you know, the same big board more or less across some of these spots. So we'll start with AJ Griffin. And if you missed it, we just did an episode with JJ Jackson, who covers the Duke Blue Devils for the Locked On Network, did kind of a dive on AJ Griffin, Paolo Bancaro, and Mark Williams. Be sure to check out that most recent episode. But Dave, I walk away incredibly excited about, about AJ Griffin. I, I'm First off, I think he is arguably, if not the clear cut, like, top small forward prospect in the draft when you, when you look at just the different prospects. Now, maybe that's a bit of a, you know, depending on if you view Jabari Smith as like a true four or a guy who can be on the wing and maybe play that small forward spot, that conversation becomes a little bit different. But if you view Jabari Smith as a four, then I think AJ Griffin takes the cake as the best uh, small forward prospect in the draft. He strikes me as a guy that is almost like a super role player where he's got like just enough of the skills and the tool set where you could envision him being able to take a bigger role when needed, but also understanding and filling the lane that he's supposed to provide for a team at, at that three spot and not necessarily be a guy who has to get a ton of touches or has to have the basketball in his hands to make a difference. And a big part of that is his shot making ability. Just the, the sheer shooting numbers are, are off the charts. Yeah, I think that was what I think blew everybody's minds. He came out shooting 40, 50 percent from three point range for a long stretch. This is for a very good team and a very good conference, uh, heavy competition. Yeah, he's got talented teammates, but at the same time, he's overcoming an injury, was you know uh, slow to get into the games and came out just firing. I think with him, there's questions about basically the medicals, you know, whether his his knees OK, because in high school, he was extremely explosive. I mean, he was very athletic. It, it popped off the screen, and we didn't really see that as much at Duke. But I think with his shooting ability, and there's just there's something about him where he just seems very well coached. He seems like he understands the game. I think his defensive potential is uh, mostly theory right now. He's had some some bad moments, but like he's six six, I believe seven foot wingspan. Um, and you know, he's, like I said, he's well coached. His dad's a former rocket, Adrian Griffin. And, uh, just, he is very polished for that, his age at just 18, which is amazing. So I like him a lot. He's always, um, kind of seemed to me kind of like a poor man's Jimmy Butler, a little shorter than, than Jimmy, but, um, just kind of has that type of, uh, that type of game, but, it's mainly, you know, athletic upside. Can he, can some of that return? Is it just been a little bit slow because he was coming back from those injuries? Um, that's the, the question that I would have for him going into workouts. Dave, either you're like the biggest, like closeted locked on rockets fan, or I just need you to get out of my head because I comped AJ in one of the earlier episodes this season, just taking kind of a preliminary look at some of the top prospects. I looked at AJ Griffin. And I was like, he's basically Jimmy Butler with a shooting stroke. Like, what is this? Like that's, <laughs> and if you're telling me you could get a guy who has like all of those physical attributes that Jimmy Butler has again, maybe some question marks about the explosiveness offensively. Sure. But Jimmy Butler with a shooting stroke, that's like a top 10, top 15 player in the NBA further down the line, which is why it leads me to think, you know, I'm so torn on what his mold is going to be at the NBA level. Is it going? And that's why I go with the term super role player, right? Like, I think you look at a guy like Clay Thompson, and he would be, to me, a super role player, you know, or or because he's borderline. You don't want to call him necessarily a superstar. Obviously, one of the greatest shooters this game has ever seen, like all of that. I, I don't want to talk about Clay Thompson too much here on a Rockets podcast. But he is like the mold of that player that you look at who fills a niche as a role player sort of for a team, but he's got that borderline star potential because he just does what he does so damn well. 
Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, now I will say, you know, Butler also comes with great defense or, you know, has in the past. And so that's sort of a question mark, but it certainly his offensive style. I mean, he can put the ball on the floor. He can get to the basket. Like I said, just, he just looks a touch slower than he did, but if he's able to get back to that with his shooting ability, I mean, he's got a nice step back shot. He can get his own shot. Uh, and I think he would play really well off the ball uh, with guys like KPJ and Jalen. I love him as far as a fit for the Rockets. Um, you know, I've had actually a hot take before thinking that his career, his NBA career would impact winning more than Paolo's uh, on, on Duke's team. And I, and I know that wouldn't be received very well, but I could see somebody on Duke um, and if not AJ being more of an impactful player down the line, even though I would think Paolo's probably going to win rookie of the year. Um, I just feel Griffin is um, a guy who's going to work hard. He's like I said, well coached. He's going to fit in in whatever role he's, he's being asked to do. Um, it's just that you have to hope that that athleticism can come back and that defensively he will put in the work as well. You know, Griffin is one of those guys where I, I think too, you have to, uh, you know, look at the fact that he's already, you know, in a situation where he had to play alongside a guy where he was, you know, kind of second fiddle, right? He was behind Paolo Bancaro in the pecking order for Duke. He was behind at times the way, you know, the guards that they had, you know, playing, you know, significantly, you know, letting them have the, the ball handling responsibilities, orchestrating the offense and whatever. So he had a very like secondary kind of tertiary role within that Duke system already and was able to thrive in that role. So that begs the question of, you know, one, is he able to translate that and, and still thrive in, you know, in a similar role at the NBA level Two, can he excel past that role? Is there something more there? And I think that's also goes back to the whole, like the Clay, the Clay Thompson equation where, Maybe Clay could have been the best player on a team had he ever been given that opportunity, but he's always been second fiddle to Steph or third banana to Steph and KD. So he never had to be the number one guy. So we never really got a glimpse of what like, you know, Clay Thompson unleashed would look like by himself as the number one de facto option. There might be a gamer here where somebody, you know, Clay and, or, you know, KD and Steph missed a game and we got a glimpse of it, but not, you know, over the stretch of a full 82 game season or a full playoff run. And so I think those are some of the questions with AJ Griffin but I also wonder when you when you look at him, to me, I think the ability to like with, with the Rockets, especially getting into kind of the fit argument, I think the hole for the Rockets conceivably is that three spot, you know, and, and maybe you argue it's the three, four spot because you look at KPJ, you look at Jalen Green and feel pretty comfortable about them being the one two moving forward, at least for now. Uh, and then you look at Shingun, who's, you know, being touted as the the five of the future by the majority of the fan base. Uh, mm -hmm. So realistically, you're looking at the holes in the roster, and that's where the three, four spots really start to come in. That's why those top three guys, the three bigs at the top of the draft are so enticing. But if you do miss out on those guys, I think you could, again, maybe Christian Wood's back next season. Maybe he's still the four moving forward. Maybe they try more of him and Shingun, you know, playing next to each other, playing off of each other. The one downside, I think, if, and maybe this shouldn't be even, you know, a part of the discussion, but KJ Martin is a guy that a lot of Rockets fans want to see get more run, maybe be vying for a starting spot next season. I think if you bring in a guy like an AJ Griffin, who's arguably going to be thrown into the starting mix right away, you know, if you're bringing in a top rookie like that, I think it shoves KJ Martin a bit further back in the rotation again, which if you're having an argument of AJ Griffin versus KJ Martin, I'm sorry, KJ, like AJ is going to win that debate, but it is one of the va variables to consider. Yeah, you're exactly right. And that's one of the big reasons it's been so important to to move some guys. I mean, really, really important. I, you know, I wrote a little bit about the possibility of trading Jay Sean Tate. I don't think the Rockets would go there, but I, I think it makes some sense just because they're going to add some threes, some fours. And, you know, you can always use a guy like Jay Sean Tate, but he's got one year left at a bargain, a steal of a deal. And, um, you know, you might have to move him. It, it, the same could apply to KJ if they're able to get value. They are going to continue to add young players. And if those guys are, you know, high level prospects, as you said, you, you know, you have to give a little bit of a, um, you know, they're higher in the hierarchy, if you will. Um, so they got to have to get some playing time. Now, granted, you take AJ Griffin, maybe he's not playing right out of the gate over um, KJ Martin and, and, and Tate and those kind of things. But down the line in your future, that's, that's the hope. That's the, the plan. So, yeah, I, I could see as far as if the Rockets were four or five, I could see them targeting a guy like A.J. Griffin if they just don't want to add a guard or go through a two-year you know, kind of build with a guy like Sharp. And that's not the, the plan that I would take. I would still go BPA regardless of, of that position need. But somebody like A.J. Griffin, Keegan Murray, Matherin, those guys uh, would be really good fits for what the Rockets need right now.
Coming up next, Iowa's Keegan Murray, number seven on our respective Rockets big boards. But first, quick message from our friends over at rockauto.com because with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models of different vehicles, it's basically impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts that you need for your car or truck. Save time and money when using rockauto.com. Why choose to spend an extra 30, 50, or even 100% more for the exact same parts from a chain store or car dealership? Rockauto.com is a family business. They've been serving do it yourselfers online for over 20 years. The prices are always reliably low for every single customer. They've got everything you could possibly need from brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even brand new carpet. So go explore their easy to use website today to find the solution to your auto parts needs. And this is the really important part. Be sure to check out like when you're when you're checking out, like first off, be sure to check out, go to the website, use it, check out. When you're checking out, be sure to write locked on in their how did you hear about us box so that they know that we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Be sure to visit rockauto.com. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, appreciate you for checking out the show, making it your first listen each and every day, free and available, all platforms. Also, check out the YouTube channel, like, and do me a huge favor, comment on the YouTube channel. It helps a million. Like, if you are on the YouTube channel, comment, just even if you put, like, a quick Go Rockets or something, it helps the algorithm. It, it gets us more, more viewers, gets it to more Rockets fans, all that stuff. So go comment on the YouTube video. For your second listen, go check out Locked on NBA. I host the Monday show. It's always a ton of fun, Monday through Friday, covering the biggest stories around the NBA, but we are here talking Rockets right now with the OG himself, Clutch fans, Dave Hardesty, and we're going to talk about Iowa's Keegan Murray, who is a really interesting prospect in the sense that I feel like as far as just like a, a really dynamic scoring fit for the Rockets, you know, if you're going to miss out on a guy like, you know, Jabari, who is, you know, just going to be a total flamethrower from three, or if you're going to miss out on Paolo Bancaro, who's, you know, the most probably all dynamic offensive guy of, of the top bunch at the top of the draft. Keegan Murray's right there, like tapping on the window of what his offensive package and, and repertoire really looks like and how exciting that could be, you know, as a member of the Houston Rockets. Yeah. I think with Keegan Murray, it's like, there's no, um, like known weaknesses for sure. I mean, he's going to be really good in transition. He can get his own shot. He can shoot threes. Um, he's pretty good defender. <clears throat> he's just not, at least the perception is he's not elite at anything, um, but very good. And so I think he's going to be a popular pick uh, in that range going into the draft. I, as far as the Rockets, I think he'd be a really good fit. I just, uh, if that's the guy they add, I think it's going to be a really solid role player around the Rockets um, star core. Just doesn't have that, in my opinion, star upside. But as far as, uh, you know, if you put that sort of not sexy pick uh, factor to the side, he can do just about everything. And he's got sort of this quality about him where he just seems really smart and really reserved and kind of to himself, uh, you know, not flashy, not um, cocky or any of those things. He's just kind of seems very humble and hardworking. And so I think he'll fit in well if the Rockets do draft him. Yeah, you know, and and I'll, I'll carry the show here for a second, Dave. If you want to mute your mic and get a couple coughs out, because it, it sounded sounded like you were you were struggling struggling yes. there for a split second. I, I had got you. No, in my it's throat. Okay. I for, forgive me. That's <laughs> I was I was going to mute it so I could cough. Um, yeah. No, you're good. Yeah. You're good. You're good, man. You're good. <laughs> I I got you. No. So, um, but with uh with, with Keegan Murray too, I I wonder if one of the drawbacks with him, and this is one of the same reservations that I have a bit about Tari Eason and what could potentially be the thing that makes maybe makes them drop a little bit with their draft stock is they are going to be on the older end of the spectrum as far as one, once they get around to the draft. So Keegan Murray is going to be almost 22 years old by the time the you know, he would be drafted and, you know, or his, his draft age, I should say. And that is, Maybe not necessarily a cause for concern, but it is something to take into consideration when you look at the rest of this Rockets young core. And you'd be adding a piece to the young core that's two years older than the rest of the Rockets young core, and yet he'll be the rookie on the squad. And that's a, you know, two years doesn't seem like a big chunk of time, especially if you're bringing in a prospect that is that exciting, you know, maybe NBA ready, you know, has kind of a refined, you know, diversified offensive game, maybe a bit of a jack of all trades type guy, like no weaknesses, master of none, what have you. But at the same time, you get into that idea of, well, you're looking at like as you're establishing this young core and growing these guys like that two year gap does kind of start to play its part like a little bit further down the line. Maybe it's not worth, you know, to, you know, taking into heavy consideration, you know, as part of the draft process, you just go for he's talented. He makes a lot of sense. He'd be an interesting fit. Go for it. But it is something just of note to throw in there as we're like looking at these different statistics for him and trying to figure out how he would fit with the Rockets. My other question is just. 
and this is kind of the question for any of these guys is how do they fit alongside Alper and Shingun? And I know we mentioned, you know, as we get away from those top guys, we start looking at how would some of these guys fit next to Alp. And I don't know, Dave, in your head, is there like a magic number where you stop looking at just best talent available and you start looking at fit? Or is it just kind of a, like a, you know, an exponential curve where like the lower in the draft you get, the more and more you start worrying about the fit. You know, it's a good question. Um, I, I do look a little bit more at fit, but I think if there's a really high upside guy, uh, you know, at 17 or if the Rockets move up or down into any of this range, I wouldn't hesitate. I wouldn't let uh, Shingun be a factor, even though I like um, Shingun. Now, Jalen Green, to me, is a factor. You have to draft um, thinking fit or thinking if this doesn't, you know, if this is not a fit with him, it's just too good of a, a prospect. The value is too high. So I'm going to I'm going to take him and then possibly trade him down the line. But it does become a factor. I mean, I, for me, I think if you were to pick on some, excuse me, pick somebody at the top of the board that is just the perfect fit for Shangun, it would probably be Chet. And I think Jabari is a really good fit as well. But Chet sort of masks those uh perceived weaknesses of Alper and Shingun, even though he's only 19. It's hard. It's hard to to box him in just yet. But I think as you get down there, um, you know, six, seven on down, you're just looking for a three or a four. Um, you could look for a defensive center. I mean, a guy like uh, Mark Williams could be re a really good fit if it was all the way down to 17. But I think most fans realize as far as fit, this team needs wings and they need, uh, you know, a four, a guy, and, and preferably somebody who can really play defense. You know, and... This is this is the frustrating part of about just team building in general is and, and maybe I'm a little bit exasperated by it because I, I'm just I, basically since the um, the the pocket rockets era with Russ and Harden to, to you know into their tenure here in Houston, Rockets have been one of the smallest teams in the association. and it's it's frustrating seeing them, you know not have the length, the physicality, the size to go up against some of these other teams. When you look around the NBA landscape and a lot of the top teams in the association have some legitimate size or they've got the, like it's, it's size and it's length. Like those are the two keys is you need athletes. Absolutely. You need guys who can make shots. You need offensive players. Sure. But you look around the NBA landscape and some of the best teams out there have a legitimate true five who like anchors things for them, who kind of, you know, occupies, patrols the paint, whatever, not necessarily a, a true blue defensive anchor, but just has either a, the size B the length or some combination thereof to make their impact felt, especially on the defensive end. And Alperin Shingun has shown flashes defensively, and I'm not going to try and take anything away from him, but he's undersized, right? 6'9", maybe 6'10", on a good day. Maybe he's got a growth spurt or two left in him, and he can, you know, shoot up to 6'11", or, or, you know, just give me give me a 7-foot Alperin Shingun, right? Because um, then we're, we're talking about more like Nikola Jokic territory. But even then, the Nuggets' defensive scheme, you know, hasn't exactly been, you know, otherworldly as of late, you know, in, in previous seasons. That's been a bit their downfall at times is their inability to stop other teams defensively, even as talented as their team has been offensively, uh, you know, in these past couple seasons, they just can't get the stops when they need it defensively. And I wonder for Al P this is my big question for him. And this kind of factors back into a guy like Keegan Murray and, and any of these other guys at the four spot in this draft, maybe Al P doesn't necessarily have to be the five of the future, right? Maybe if he slims down a little bit, he could be maybe the four. And then the Rockets could look at a guy like we've got on our boards a little bit later on, like a Jalen Duran, or maybe a little bit further past that, like a Mark Williams, as more of the true de facto five to help anchor the team. It's an interesting thought, and it's possible. Um, <clears throat> I think his speed, his lateral quickness needs to increase. So he's going to have to, you know, obviously keep working out, get in better shape. Uh, you know, with him, he's he's got to develop better range. His three-point shot hasn't been very good. And I think that's the problem. Um, you know, Alp is like he's he's got this incredible ability. Like he's he's got a, a great mind for the game. Like his his IQ is off the charts. His passing is really good. He can score around the basket. He's not athletic. He's you know not very athletic. I wouldn't call him a plus athlete. Certainly, um, he's and his shooting ability is is not there yet. Now I think the shooting will come with time. It's just hard in this day and age, in this in this game, to have a four who you know doesn't necessarily spread the floor. I think he can he can you know be out on the perimeter and operate in different ways, but that shot isn't a, isn't completely a threat yet. I think it'll come um, in time. But he's you know we've talked about this before, you and I. It's like he's a very tough player to build around because he just doesn't fit. 
the, the kind of archetype that you're talking about right, you know, right now, athletic, long, active <clears throat> defenders. I mean, look at uh, New Orleans and the impact that Herb Jones is having, uh, you know, Memphis and Minnesota. And I would probably put those three teams as the three teams the Rockets are competing against. And then you've got, you know, Sacramento and OKC, and they're trying to find the same type of players to get up there in re in their rebuilds as well. So I, it's just a challenge to build around Shingun. I, I could see him possibly becoming a four, but he's going to have to transform his game. Uh, you know, he's going to have to add some things to his game to do that because his strength is around the basket and making uh, moves out of the elbow and the high post, uh, you know, running offense, orchestrating offense. Um, so it'll be interesting, but he's very young and you've got a lot of uh, potential things that he could become over time. We fell down a, an Alper and Shingun rabbit hole there, kind of debating <laughs> fit for this Rockets team. So I want to bring it back to Keegan Murray here for one more sure. point, because when I when I look at Keegan Murray, you know, I kind of get the sense, you know, he's got that bit, that bigger body, that size. I, I'm not completely locked into him necessarily being, you know, a de facto four. I think it's maybe the same conversation could be had about Keegan Murray that you can have about Jabari Smith. I think Jabari Smith has a, a better body to maybe be able to guard some threes at the NBA level and, and kind of has the foot speed to do it. I think it's a bit more of a question mark with Keegan Murray, at least mm -hmm. on the defensive end. But I do see kind of shades of like, maybe like an Otto Porter Jr.-esque type player there. Uh, maybe a bit more of a, a well-rounded offensive game than Otto Porter Jr., at least, at least coming out. Um, is there a, a, a facet of his game though, Dave, where you're, that gives you a bit of a pause for concern as, as to why you, you maybe think either the Rockets would pass on him or, or wouldn't be as high on him as we are currently? Um, you know, nothing that gives me a huge concern other than the fact that the upside is not as high as, um, some of these other guys. And that doesn't mean that those guys are going to hit that upside, but I think with Keegan, you, you spelled it out really well. He's 22. And when you think about some of these other guys being 18, 19, that's two to three years of development and growth that they have to, to improve. And if they've got the measurables and the athleticism, you're thinking how good could they be or how good they could become. And I think with Keegan Murray, which there's nothing wrong with this. He, he was very, very productive at Iowa. It's just, is he going to get better? And you know, it, I mean, I think he can, but generally speaking at that age, you're not going to add a ton more uh, of, you know, things to your game necessarily. Uh, and that's, I think the, the only question mark with him, I think he's going to be a very solid player in the league. Um, but I just don't know if that, if he necessarily has a superstar ceiling. That feels like a good spot to stop part one of our discussion of our respective Rockets big boards, six through 10. Dave, do me a favor. Let me know where to track you down at. Sure. Uh, it's on Twitter at clutch fans and the website is clutchfans.net. Uh, and just yeah, talking rockets 24 seven, pretty much. Dave, a pleasure to have you on the program. Be sure you've got to tune back in for part two because Dave and I are not done discussing this. We've got our part two coming up here just shortly in the following day. It'll be out next day, in fact, not, not even following days, just the following day. So be sure to tune back in for that for today's episode. That's going to do it. If you haven't done so yet, consider subscribing wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google, the brand new Odyssey app, free and available on all platforms. Also, check out the YouTube channel. Go comment on the YouTube channel. If we break like 100 comments on this YouTube video, I will love you guys dearly forever. Go comment. Comment, just say go Rockets or like tell me your thoughts about the team. I do read every single one of those. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.